Well, welcome back to the study of this uh, truly fascinating book. And it's given to us, as we saw from the very beginning, there's a special blessing to those who read this, hear it, take heed to it. And I think we've already can see some of the enormous benefit and blessing that can come to us through a book like this. We are finally ready now uh, to see what happens when the Lamb takes the scroll and he takes it in his hand and then he begins to break each one of these seven seals that keep this held together. We have said that I believe this scroll represents the title deed to the entire earth and all that is in it. And when the Lamb, who alone is worthy to take the scroll and to break the seals thereof, when he arises, when he moves forward, when he takes it from the hand of him who sits upon the throne, as we've seen, all heaven explodes into joy and gladness and adoration. It's a celebration of the first magnitude in heaven. Why? Because finally, finally, he's going to take what is his, what he has a right to take. He's Lord of Lords. He's King of Kings. And it will be that finally iniquity and unrighteousness and cruelty and sin that has dominated the face of this earth is going to be wiped away. Well might heaven rejoice. But two, in the words of Francis Ridley Havergal, Jesus is coming. He's coming again. He's going to be vindicated and enthroned under earth's remotest ends, glorified, adored, and owned. The chorus says, oh, the joy to see thee reigning. Well, that's joy in heaven. So the picture there is just explosive praise, worship, and adoration to him who sits on the throne and under the Lamb. The thing are coming finally to an end, and God will reign supreme. However, as he breaks each one of these seals, it's a very different picture on the earth, because each time one of these seals are broken, it means great judgment will fall on rebellious mankind. Well, let's pray together. As we come now to look here at Revelation chapter 6. <clears throat> Father, praise you and thank you so very, very much that whatever we think and whatever we understand is of minor importance because these things will surely come to pass. As the angel said, these things must come to pass. And we're thankful that that's true that nothing will prevent it, that you will reign in the end, you will have your will done, and that the gates of hell will not prevail against you. You will build your church, and you will see your son vindicated and enthroned. You will see him reign. We don't yet see all things put under his feet, but we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels. But someday we will. <laughs> someday we'll see all things put under his feet to the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To you, Lord, we give our praise. And to you we look for wisdom, understanding, uh, to enter in and to obey and do what you would have us to do and be the kind of people you would have us to be on the earth in our era at this time. So we commit this time to you with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we've suggested, these seven seals now will unleash forces and factors that are going to be apparent throughout the entire tribulation period. Now, this is the picture that we painted for you previously, that as I've seen it, that 
the seven seals, because of where it ends, as we'll see in the sixth seal, that's right on the very moment of the second coming of Christ. So the seven seals span the entire tribulation period, but they unleash forces and factors that I think will be evident more specifically in the trumpets and in the bowls. And so as we begin to look at this, hopefully that helps. Hopefully that'll help you keep a little bit of this in mind. Now it leads, in, as I said in the sixth seal, right up to the very eve of the second coming of Christ. Now there are many in, that have noted the fact that there is a near exact parallel here to what our Lord says in the Olivet Discourse. And let me let you have a look at here. The Olivet Discourse and Revelation chapter 6. Now, it's, of course, this parallel is remarkable. I mean, it's a one-to-one -one all the way down the line, is it not? And certainly, the Praetorists, as you remember, the Praetorists are those who believe that everything in the book of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 A.D. At least a good, most of them think this. So when they look at something like this and say, aha, there you go, what more do you need to know? It is. The parallel here is to them convincing proof that Revelation is all about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And we have to admit, obviously, there's a very real parallel here. And they can cite things historically through the Jewish historian Josephus and look at this biblically here and think, aha, it confirms what we thought, what we teach. This all fulfilled in John's day. Now, there is, however, I think, several mistakes that the Praetorist makes in this. Because if we look more closely at what our Lord says, they think there's just one question here. But it seems evident that there's actually more than one. Let's have a look now at Matthew chapter 24 and verses 1 to 3. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to the point out of the temple to point out the temple buildings to him. They're probably trying to encourage him. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful, Lord? There is something good here. Mm. But Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. That was stunning to these disciples. They were shocked when they heard it, it would seem. And so later, that thought they kept in their minds, but later, when he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and that setting significant, the disciples came to him privately saying, Lord, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. Now, on the surface, it seems they're asking, when is the temple going to be destroyed? But they, in their minds, they see that those, his coming again and the destruction of the temple have to be one and the same things, it would seem, in their thinking or in their understanding. So for them, there's maybe in their minds one question here. To these disciples, the destruction of the temple must surely mean the end of the age, because this would be the end of Judaism in their minds. But we know that's not true. That was not the case. And certainly, it's evident that Jesus had more in mind than that. But it isn't surprising that they would have collapsed these 
almost three questions, when and um, the sign and the actual end of the age, collapse it all into one moment or one question. But there was a reason for them to think this way, but not us. We should know better. We do know better. But the Praetors does maintain this. He holds on to this, and he collapses into one event, the destruction of the temple. Everything we read here in Matthew 24 and in the book of Revelation as well. Now, what is really happening here? Well, we have a local mountain here in Greenville, South Carolina. It's about an hour from here, actually. And there are many people who like to hike up this mountain. And it's quite a climb. It's very arduous. It's a good hour, 45, two hours of pretty steady climbing to get to the very, very top of this. Now, I remember sometimes they give you some switchbacks, as I recall, but it's pretty much you're climbing the entire time. And I remember I'd been at this. I'd never gone up this. I thought, well, let's do this. And so I was hiking up this mountain. And after about an hour of this, uh, I looked up and there was, I could see the mountain kind of end and it looked like and blue sky behind it and I thought oh praise God we've gotten to the top of this thing and no the closer I got to the top I began to get over the the initial level of this ground and then what did I see I saw a ridge that led out beyond it and then a whole nother end of the mountain it's what we hikers or climbers call a false peak. I mean, it looks like you're at the peak. You're at the very peak. But no, you're not. Now, that false peak is actually a part of the mountain, but it there's so much more further away and so much bigger and so much higher than that first peak that you reached. Now, I want to suggest to you that that is what is happening here in Matthew 24. There is a lot about this that we read here that's applicable to 70 AD. But it is also a parallel to something much, much bigger and much grander than that. You could focus on the destruction of the temple here, but there's so much more to this mountain. And there is way more to this passage. To confine all of this to 70 AD, it really simply doesn't work. Try as hard as the Praetorists do. For instance, let me give you one of the signs that they don't mention in the parallels. But look at Matthew 24 and verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, <laughs> they do try to make the point that, well, uh, that was fulfilled in 70 AD or before, and they cite references such as Colossians 1.6 or Romans 1.8 when Paul says, and this gospel has been preached in uh, throughout the whole world. It has been sounded throughout the whole world. He says that in Romans 1.8 and um, sounded out from you around the whole world. Oh, well, it is probably true when Paul said that, that Paul meant the whole Roman world. And so Praetorists assume that, okay, this was fulfilled. Paul says so. But the important thing about this Olivet Discourse is not what Paul means by those expressions, but what does Jesus mean by it? Look what Jesus said. What does he mean by the expression, the whole world? Well, he tells us. He means all nations. All nations. Not just the Roman Empire, 
but all nations. He says so. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony, what? To all nations. And then, and only then, will the end come. Now, to add reinforcement to this, this is ethnos, all nations. It is the exact phrase that's used in the Great Commission. When Jesus said that you're to make disciples of all nations. So surely now the preterists don't want to say that the Great Commission only extends to the Roman world, do they? No. Jesus expanded and made filled out his understanding of the whole world to include all nations. And we know indeed with the Great Commission, same thing he said there, all nations is the Great Commission. So that's what was in Jesus' mind. It seems evident. So that does not fit a fulfilled uh, item of 70 AD. This is another reason why I think this is a false peak to think only about the destruction of the temple. I think it's even more clear when you get to verse 29. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is what he goes on to say, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth, not just Israel, but all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Not just Israel's going to see this. whole world's going to see this. The whole world will be aware of it. That did not happen in 70 A.D. Now, these phrases here connected with this, him coming in the, uh, the Son of God, that's a parallel. What we saw here in Romans 6, he says it, Almost the exact same thing, but it's the culmination of all God's dealing with lost, rebellious mankind. Now, these cataclysmic events immediately precede the second coming of Christ, and they're an expression of God's wrath on the whole world, not just Israel. There's a parallel to this in Isaiah. Here in Isaiah, you remember Revelation is filled with references to the Old Testament. Isaiah 34 and 1 through 4. Draw near, O nations, Isaiah says, to hear and listen, O peoples. Let the earth and all it contains hear, and the world and all that springs from it. It's bigger than Israel. For the Lord's indignation is against all nations, His wrath against all armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. So their slain will be thrown out and their corpses will give off their stench and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. Notice how he expresses that moment when that comes. And all the host of heaven will wear away and the sky will be rolled up like a scroll, and all their host will also wither away as a leaf withers from the vine, as one withers from the fig tree. So here you see something happening cataclysmically in the heavens. In Daniel chapter 7, the one who comes in the clouds, like we read here in Matthew 7, he doesn't come to destroy the temple in Jerusalem, he comes to reign. Look at Daniel 7, when it mentions coming in the clouds. Uh, this isn't a mysterious coming. This is an, an obvious, overt coming. Daniel 7 in verse 13. I saw in the night visions. Behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, we know this to be the Messiah, Jesus, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples 
nations, languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So this is a worldwide dominion uh, emanating from the Lord Jesus. When we see these cataclysmic events transpiring in the heavens. So that, yes, the Olivet Discourse is a parallel to Romans chapter 6, but it's bigger than the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. It's a parallel. It's a, a somewhat of a, a picture, a preview of something that's going to be enormously bigger than a temple in Jerusalem, but the whole dominion of man over the face of the earth. So then, let's then come back to what we've seen here in, in Revelation chapter 6, and let's see what we can find here about these seven seals and the breaking of these seven seals. Now, the first thing we ought to notice and pay attention to is there's seven of them. And as we've seen, this is a symbolic number. Seven is the number of perfection, completion, that's fullness. And so this is uh, total and complete encompassing. Now, the next thing, when you look a little closer at these, it's easy to see that it's divided into four, two, and one. Is it not? There are four horses. Then you find two that follow it that are different, a pause, and then you come to the last. Now, this same pattern of four, two, and one, we're going to see it again when we get to the trumpets. Now then, we also can see that these this number four is significant and symbolic that here, as we've been uh, thought before, four has some clear symbolic significance. And throughout the scriptures, it's largely associated with the things of the created earth. You have here the earth as a place, as a habitation, was completely finished in day four. And so the number four was a completion of the earth, the created realm. And then in five and six, you start adding creatures to inhabit what was created. And so four came to mean, I think in the Jewish mind, earth, a, a completed perfect earth or something encompassing the earth. Flip over here in the book of Revelation to Revelation 7 and just look over a moment. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds. Now, they have four corners like a map, meaning they're standing north, south, east, and west. They're encompassing the, the entire globe. And it mentions that they move in these four corners of the earth and hold back four winds. Now, that's the whole earth. Once again, four associated with the totality of the earth. So that when we think about this, this is a direction associated with things encompassing all that is on the earth. And this becomes hugely significant because it's, a, it's going to impact life worldwide, not just Israel or certain segments, but it's going to have a worldwide impact. Now, let's look again <clears throat> at the fact that they are... Uh, Horses. Now, an artist has taken to draw this, and it's pretty frightening, is it not, <coughs> when we look at it? But there's a parallel here to Zechariah chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Here we also see 
uh, four horses. In Zechariah, they're a little bit different. And they have a little bit different function as well. Zechariah, though, does speak of these four horses. This just shows me the unity of Scripture that is one author, and he ties together the old and the new. Zechariah 6 and verse 1. Now I, Zechariah, lifted up my eyes again and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming forth from two mountains, and the mountains were bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth a dappled horse, like an Appaloosa spotted. And then I spoke and said to the angel who was speaking to me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel said, These are the four spirits of heaven going forth after standing for the Lord of all the earth with one of which the black horses are going forth to the north and the south and so forth. And they say this, verse 7, when the strong ones went out, they were eager to go to what? To patrol the earth. And he said, go patrol the earth. And so they did so. Now, so these are pictured for us, these angels or forces that are dominating all over the earth. So that when these four horses ride, the whole earth is going to be impacted by what we see here. These are the four horses of the uh, apocalypse. So then, let's consider then and get down into the details now of these seven seals. Now, I lifted up my eyes, and I'm sorry, let me get back to where we belong here in, in the book of Revelation. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a loud uh, with a voice of thunder, come. So I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. A white horse, and one sits on it, has a bow, has a, a crown, and he's coming uh, to conquer. Now, many have immediately suggested that this has to be Jesus since in Revelation 19, 11, he is said to come on a white horse. See a white horse and him who sits upon it who's called the Word of God. And so the meaning, oh, this is Jesus then. But that's a hasty conclusion because I want you to look more carefully and I think you'll see that there's some, that, a very little lame kind of similarity between these two. Think for a minute about the differences. The first seal. This one comes with a bow. I'm sorry, I misspelled uh, something here, and I'm not going to take the time to correct it. And Many misspellings, forgive me. But this one comes with a bow. Jesus... Revelation 9, he comes with a sword. That's different. This one has one crown. <laughs> Jesus comes with many crowns. This one comes to conquer. Here's another misspelling. Forgive me. Jesus is already conquered. He comes to reign. This one is just one of a terrible set of judgments, one of four horses that come riding forth. All the other three are terrible. So would this one be other, utterly unlike the other three? Hmm. Seems equal to them all. No. Jesus stands alone as the one who brings righteousness and peace upon the earth. So who is this and what does this represent? Well, 
Yes, we've already seen that Satan's the counterfeiter, and you're going to see that all the way through this book. He counterfeits the Trinity. We talked about him counterfeiting the gospel. He counterfeits the Trinity, he counterfeits the church, and we know the Antichrist will be a counterfeit of Jesus. Well, I believe this and resembles him. This is the Antichrist. Remember in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul tells us that the Lord won't come until that lawless one, that son of perdition, will be revealed. So I think you begin here with this Antichrist emerging onto the scene. So back to what we've seen here. He's a conqueror, but by force that is given to him. Well, we come to the next seal. And when he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say again, Come. And another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. That's just violence. Remember in Noah's day, violence uh, covered the face of the earth. Just what we've said here is that the Lord's waiting for iniquity to wax full on the face of this earth. But it's just coming unglued, men in their cruelty one to another. Here's the red horse, the shedding of blood. The third seal is now broken. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come, I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not damage the oil and the wine. A denarius was a, a day's wage. And when he speaks about a quart of wheat, just think of that as like a loaf of bread. All right, at $10 an hour, would you want to be paying $80 for a loaf of bread? Wow. So what does that tell you? Famine. Food is scarce. It has enormous value now, and people are willing to work all day to get just a little bit of bread. This is famine in the land, the black horse. All right, let's come to the fourth horse. And when the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, I looked, and behold, an ashen horse. And he who sat on it had the name Death. And Hades was following with him. Now, authority was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with famine, with pestilence, the plagues, and by the wild beasts of the earth. This one is terrible indeed. Now, this ashen color is the color of death. It's a palish greenish gray, the, the ashen color of death. Now, this one differs from Zechariah that was uh, that dappled Appaloosa color because this horse has a different function. Those horses patrolled. These horses bring judgments upon the earth. Death and hell. This horse is the culmination of the effects of the three previous horses. And when it says a fourth of the earth, my land's if we put that together now, that's almost two billion people will perish. Horrendous uh, is the impact of these judgments that descend upon the earth. It's a, but I see these as a culmination of the whole period. Those are the four horses. Now we come to that which is separate, the fifth seal. And when the lamb broke the fifth seal, 
I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain. Why? Because of the Word of God, because they stood for the Word of God, and because of the testimony which they had maintained, like Revelation 22, they loved not their lives. Um, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies, and they loved not their lives unto the death. It's these, the testimony that they maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now, as we've said, there's this clamoring in heaven. Lord, how long are you going to let them do this? How much are you going to put up with in light of this? And they stand there before the Lord. But I tell you, God is way more patient than we are. And he's way more long-suffering than we can imagine. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. He takes no displeasure in the destruction of the wicked. And all heaven's going to be wondering, how can he keep it up? How can he not judge this? But God's heart breaks. He doesn't want to judge, but he waits. He waits hoping and perhaps and waiting for those who will repent, will turn from their sins and iniquities until the bride be complete. He will not move. He waits for that cup of iniquity. Remember, he wouldn't let Israel go and take the land of Canaan because the cup of their iniquity was not yet full. He waits. He lets man have his way, have his plans, have his decisions. But the long suffering of God is in this book is truly amazing. So he waits. Now, they are comforted in this regard. Verse 11, And there was given to each of them a white robe. That speaks of righteousness and purity, forgiveness of sins. And they were told that they should rest, just wait, a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also in God's perfect design. He's going to complete that church for a lamb and for a bridegroom. Well, now we come to this sixth seal, which we've already considered here. And I looked, and when he broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. And in spite of what Josephus said, I don't believe any of this is an exact parallel to 70 AD. This is cataclysmic events right on the eve of the coming of Jesus Christ. And the sky was split apart. Uh, rather, stars fell to the earth like meteors. A, a fig tree cast its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then we're given a picture of the people on the earth's reaction to something. Well, it's the coming of Jesus Christ. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich, strong, every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. I think this is a picture of Armageddon when Jesus returns to, to those who are assembled against him. And they said to the mountains, to the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb that's so awe-inspiring they can't stand to look upon him. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Wow, what a picture. And you see then why I say this brings us right to the very moment of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the, the seven seals, we have six now, they, when he breaks the seventh, 
then what happens? Well, the scroll can be unrolled. Then these events begin to transpire. Right now, they just symbolize these things, but once these things are broken, now the action begins. It unrolls, it un it's the scroll is uh, taken open. And so here are your six seals. Now, we come, though, before the seventh, to our first real parenthesis in this book. And I said there are many. And that's what makes it interesting but difficult to manage. It's just here in the midst of all of this judgment that John is given some reassurances about this fact that God will preserve a people for himself. You know, God always preserves a remnant. He did it in Elijah's day, and he'll do it here, even in the end of the times here. And they will be marked as his possession. Let's have a look now at what we find here in chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels, we've read this, standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or in any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal that's of ownership of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea and said, Don't. Wait. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed it was 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And then he goes down and lists 12 tribes here. The tribe of Dan is not mentioned. Some say because he fell into idolatry, the first tribe to do so in the book of Judges. But you do have Manasseh, and then the tribe of Joseph is really Ephraim to fill out the 12. But you have 12. He sticks with the number 12. So these are called uh, sealed, meaning there it would appear they're not going to be touched by the plagues that are going to descend upon this book. Now, if you'll turn over to Revelation 14, we'll see this 144,000 again, and they're with the Lamb upon the Mount of Olives. They're there when He returns. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of a harpist playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And these have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found in their mouth, they are blameless. So here then is description of these 144,000. So there are a lot of questions that arise out of this. Is this a literal number? Now, we ought to be immediately triggered here that 12 has been used so frequently in the Bible to symbolize all of God's people. Twelve tribes of Israel, twelve apostles. We look at the new city coming down to the earth, New Jerusalem, which is the bride of Christ. 
12 foundations, which are the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 gates, 12 apostles, but one people of God, one church, one bride for the, for the lamb, but the 12 together, that represents the entire people of God. And 10 is a number of completeness or com completion as well as seven. Further descriptive of these, they have his name on their forehead. They are purchased, possessions of his. They are pure. And he mentions this in Revelation 14 and says they, they have not defiled themselves with women. I take that to mean not physical purity. And there's nothing wrong with the sexual relationships between a man and his wife, to be sure, but rather spiritual purity. As Paul said, I, I've uh, espoused you uh, to, to one bridegroom to be a chaste virgin. He's speaking there in um, 2 Corinthians um, chapter 10 about being spiritually set apart, spiritually pure, devoted to one husband and one bridegroom and one fiance and loyal and faithful to him. So I believe that's, this is a spiritual uh, characteristic of these individuals, not just, not at all physical. But they are pure and they will last through the entire tribulation because here we see them standing on Mount Zion next to the Lord Jesus. It's though these have been somehow preserved and, and protected. So the question arises to us then is, who are these? And that raises some questions indeed. Are these what it seems to be Jewish believers? They're believers, they're purchased. Or is this all symbolic? And it just represents a remnant of all believers. Now, I just have to tell you, this is not as easy as it might seem. Because... We're running out of time here, but in, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9 and Revelation 3, 9, this is in the book now, in the book of Revelation, it speaks of Jews, but it speaks of Jews as believers. In 2, 9, he speaks about this, those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan, now, why would he warn the church of Smyrna about really Jews that are Jews? No, he's speaking about, he's using the word Jew there to represent uh, a child of God or one of God's people. The same thing is repeated in 3.9. The synagogue was saying, who say they are Jews and are not. This represents, are they really true um, members of the covenant? Are they descendants of Abraham? Uh, and he says they, they're phonies. Paul talked about this, that it's bigger than just physical descendants. In Romans chapter 2, uh, there Paul mentions this, that 2.28, having to hasten here, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, and not, not just physical, nor is circumcision that which is outward. This is Romans 2, 28 and 29. But he is a Jew is one inwardly, and the circumcision that which is of the heart. Real, it's reality, and he's speaking of Jew as being um, of uh, the covenant of Abraham, of a child of God, a believer not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Well, there are other verses that tie into that, and certainly in Paul's thinking, it's quite clear. In Galatians chapter 3, and 26 to 29, Paul makes it abundantly clear that there's one people, not two people, 3, 26 to 29, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 
there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, and listen to this, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So he makes it a spiritual connection, not a physical one. In Galatians 6, in verse 16, 15 and 16, he says this, For neither is circumcision anything or uncircumcision, but what really matters is a changed heart, a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, who are part of the new creation, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That's, he's talking to Gentiles. This is all people. The fact that their name, that he says is his name's on their forehead, that's a, true of all believers in Revelation 22, 4. The fact that they're purchased possessions, that's true of every believer, Revelation 5, 9. But what about them being specifically Jewish believers? Well, again, we've read this in, in, in Revelation 7, 4 to 8. It does strike me that he goes out of his way to elaborate on every single tribe. Now, he could be symbolizing all tribes of, uh, around the earth. But I don't know, it doesn't seem necessary to get down to the details of this. The other reason why there might be an inclination to believe this is because of what Paul tells us will happen with the Jewish people in the end times. In Romans chapter 11, he speaks there in that final chapter about why God's allowed Gentiles to enter into the you know, covenant relationship and so many Gentiles, so few Jews. He says, because the day's coming, I'm going to graft back in the native branch, the Jewish people. It's not. This is an apocalyptic literature here. This is Paul saying, Upright, this is what's going to be the destiny of the Jewish people. In Romans chapter 11, And I say then, they didn't stumble so as to fall completely away, did they? The Jewish, may it never be. But by their transgression, the Jewish people, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous, to make the Jewish people jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles as much as then I'm an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my, my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow come Jews and save some of them. But then he goes on to say this in, in Revelation 20, 11, 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimate. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then all Israel will be saved. Then he quotes the Old Testament. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And he goes on to talk about this, but all Israel um, will be saved. And is this, we see here in Revelation 7, a picture then of these Jews being reclaimed. Uh, so <laughs> feel free to disagree. <laughs> but here's how I see this. I can't get away from the 12 number. I think, I do not think this is just a random number. I believe this is uh, symbolic of a vast, a perfect portion of God's people. Do I think it's Jewish? I think if it's not completely Jewish believers, I think it's predominantly Jewish believers. But I want to say this to you, these are on the earth during this time of tribulation. They're sealed and marked. They're there at the beginning. They're there at the end. 
they're standing with him on Mount Zion. So whatever else we think about this, we have to allow for the fact that God kept a remnant for himself even in these most difficult of times. Now let me hasten to the last of this chapter. This whole chapter is to reassure us that God is in control and God does keep his own. Saints on the earth, this last part here in the book of Revelation speaks of those saints that are in heaven that were martyred, but they're kept likewise. And just indulge me a minute more, please. After these things, I look, verse 9 of Revelation 7, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, all tribes and peoples and tongues, and they're all standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes, righteousness, and palm branches were in their hands to worship. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They're worshiping gladheartedly. And all the angels were standing around the throne, around the, the elders and the four living creatures, and they all fell on their faces before the throne. And with happy hearts they worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. In heaven, there is unbounded joy in earth. Oh, terrible, terrible happenings. On, in heaven, unbounded joy and happiness. And then one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? And where have they come from? So John asked, and, and I, no, the angel asked John, or one of the elders, I'm sorry, one of the elders asked John, and John humbly says, uh, my Lord, you know, I don't. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And for this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tabernacle over them, his tent. And they will hunger no more, nor thirst any more, nor will the sun beat down upon them, nor any heat. For the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of water of life, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. How beautiful. That's this church in heaven. So there are saints in heaven worshiping God with joy and gladness. And there are saints on the earth, and a set number of them have been set aside, but many are going to be martyred. But at least this undeterminate number will be, be sealed by God through the, the stretch of this time. There's plenty of room to disagree <laughs> when we come to these things and we're trying to grasp the picture of what is going to transpire, but God knows. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you. You keep your own. That much is crystal clear here. That we are kept by the power of God unto salvation, reserved for us. And our inheritance is protected and kept, and we are kept and protected for our inheritance, whatever transpires. And we just praise you and thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, thanks for your long-suffering.